chapter nine. This um, chapter, I decided to use the PowerPoint slides that are provided by the textbook because they have some good visuals to go along with the content that we're learning. So hopefully you'll find them um, useful as well. We start out chapter nine talking about types of chemical reactions. And pretty much what this is is um, chemical reactions fit into a couple of different broad categories. And what's great about these is that once you know what the patterns are, you can predict all kinds of products and reactant combinations um, and what kind of chemical reactions you'll be seeing. So just a brief review, remember a chemical reaction is a process in which you start with um, one type of substance and through the breaking and making of bonds and the rearrangement of atoms and elements, you um, produce a new substance as a result of that chemical change. These are broadly classified and, and grouped into um, combination reactions, decomposition reactions, single replacement reactions, double replacement reactions, and combustion reactions. So let's look more closely at each of these. First with the combination reaction, in this case you're starting with elements and you're producing a compound. Now, Mr. Stoker in your textbook says that you can start with two compounds and produce a compound. And that is also true of combination reactions. And you'll want to remember that. But when you're faced on an exam with the question of something um, undergoes a combination reaction, keep it simple. Remember, I can just start with the elements and go to the compound because that will um, be much easier for you than trying to decide what two compounds something makes up. So these follow the general format of X plus Y goes to XY. So there we can see element, element X reacting with element Y to produce compound XY. And in this example, you can see um, hydrogen, an element, reacting with oxygen, an element, to make a compound. The typical um, type of question that you might run into this is something like calcium phosphate undergoes a combination reaction. Or um, another heads up, combination reactions are also called synthesis reactions. So we could say calcium phosphate, phosphate is synthesized. write out and balance the reaction for that. So if we think about this, it's telling us the compound. So it's telling us the product. So let's think about what's the formula of calcium phosphate. Well, it's got calcium, which is a plus two charge, and it's got phosphate, which is one of our polyatomic ions, which has a negative three charge. Um, and when we put those two together, we get Ca3PO42. Now we go backwards. If that's the identity of my product here, then my reactants must be the individual elements that make up calcium phosphate. So in this case, it's calcium plus phosphorus plus oxygen. And notice I'm remembering that oxygen is one of the silly seven, and so therefore it shows up as a diatomic. And my last step before I'm done here is to make sure everybody balances out. So I need three calciums and two phosphorus and eight oxygens. So that would be the calcium phosphate synthesis reaction or the calcium phosphate combination reaction. Those are equivalent um, terms. We also have decomposition reactions. These are the opposite of combination or synthesis reactions. In this case, we're starting with a single reactant. We're starting with our compound and we are producing um, pieces of that compound broken up into simpler substances. So again, Stoker says these could be elements or compounds, and that is true. For the purpose of tests and quizzes, just focus on the fact that things can turn into elements. Let's keep it simpler for you. So opposite here, we're starting with the compound and we're breaking it into its individual elements. And we can look at water, the decomposition reaction of water. I've started with water, I've decomposed it into its individual elements of hydrogen and oxygen. We could also say something like magnesium oxide undergoes decomposition. Um, so magnesium oxide then would be my reactant, and my products would be what? If magnesium oxide is my reactant, then the products would be the elements that make up magnesium oxide, and they would be magnesium and oxygen. 
and then balance before you're done. Single replacement was our next category. In this case, you have an atom or a molecule coming in and bumping out an atom um, or a group of atoms in a compound. So this follows the general format, x plus yz goes to y plus xz. And this actually can also produce, depending on the nature of x, it could produce z plus yx. And why I say this is it depends on whether x is a metal or a nonmetal. If x is a metal, um, it will come in and bump out the metal, like it did here. If x is a nonmetal, in this case, then x would come in and bump out the nonmetal and form an ionic compound with the metal. So up here, x was a metal. And down here, X was a nonmetal. In both cases, what's happening in the reaction is that the that the sink is that the single element is coming in and bumping out the thing in the compound that it's like. So if X is a nonmetal, it comes in and bumps out the nonmetal. If X is a metal, it comes in and bumps out the metal. So for an, for instance, we can look here at zinc reacting with hydrochloric acid to make zinc chloride and, hyd and hydrogen. Zinc, notice, is a metal. So when it goes to react with HCl, it comes in and bumps out the H. So zinc now forms a compound with chlorine, and hydrogen is now kicked out to the side. If instead of zinc reacting, let's say we had oxygen reacting plus HCl, in this case, oxygen is a nonmetal, which means when it looks at H and Cl, H is acting as the cation in this ionic compound. Oxygen we know is a nonmetal. Nonmetals are anions. So oxygen will come in and replace the thing that it's like, so it will replace the Cl. Now that means when we come up with our product over here, we've got a product that's forming between H plus and the oxygen anion which is oxide, which is O minus 2. So when we have H plus and O minus 2, they get together. They form an ionic compound according to the rules that we know for the formation of ionic compounds, and that gives us water. What's left is what got bumped out, which is the chlorine. It's a diatomic silly 7 um, molecule for us, so it gets bumped out and becomes um, Cl2. And then our last step would be to run through here and balance everything, and so we end up with this as our balanced chemical reaction. We also have double replacement reactions. In this case, you have two substance, two compounds which are swapping partners to form two new compounds. So the general format is AX plus BY goes to AY plus BX. And notice here what's happening can really be discussed in terms of A swapping with B. So now A and Y are hooked up, and B and X are hooked up. Let's look at an example. So just looking at the reactant side, we see we have sodium sulfate. This is, in terms of the raw materials of elements, we have sodium ion and sulfate ion. And over here in our other reactant, we have lead ion, lead plus two ion, and nitrate ion. So double replacement says the metals or the cations are going to swap places. So now lead will make a pair with sulfate and sodium will make a pair with nitrate. And indeed, when we look over here, we see that my sodium ion, which was plus one, and my nitrate ion, which were negative one, form sodium nitrate. And over here, my lead plus two and my sulfate negative two formed an ion excuse me, formed a compound. Let's walk through an example of this one. Calcium chloride reacts with sodium nitride in a double replacement reaction. So take a moment, hit pause, see how far you get on writing out and balancing this equation, and then start the video back up again, and we'll work through it together. Okay, so calcium chloride. We know that calcium chloride has the formula CaCl2. Sodium nitride, we know, has the formula Na3N. 
the question is, what are our two products? And the approach to this that we just did that's really useful is to think about this in terms of what are the ions that I have to work with? Well, I've got a calcium plus two ion and I've got a Cl minus ion. Now notice, I'm not taking into account how many chloride ions I have and how many calcium ions I have because that will change in terms of how many I need on the products depending on what they're paired up with. So for right now, I'm ignoring how much there is because I know that eventually I'm gonna balance the reaction and that will take care of things. In my other reactant, I have sodium ion and I have nitride ion. So if my metals swap places, that means that sodium will make, ion will make a formula with, a, excuse me, a formula, a compound with chloride ion, and calcium will make a compound with nitride. So then it's just a matter of taking the two ions and going from their charges to figure out their formulas. So sodium plus one and chlorine minus one, I only need one of each, so my formula is NaCl. Calcium plus two, nitride minus three means I need three calciums to balance out the charge of the nitrogens, and I need two nitrogens, and those are the formulas of my products. Now, I can deal with the fact that I have unequal amounts of each type of ion in each type of the reaction, and that's okay. That's what balancing the reaction does for me. So I've got um, three sodiums and two nitrogens on each side, and that tells me I'm probably gonna have to deal with six as the lowest common multiple here. Let's see if we can get away with that. So I'm gonna put a two here, um, which will take care of my nitrogens, and I'll put a three here, which will take care of my calciums, and, and in both cases, I've produced six sodiums and six chlorines, which means that this becomes a coefficient of six. One thing about this chapter for sure is if you haven't gotten good with balancing chemical reactions, you definitely will be good by the time you're done with this. Our last type of reaction is a combustion reaction. And um, in Chemistry 121, we're gonna limit, there are more combustion reactions than we're gonna talk about, but we're gonna talk about one, one um, subset of them, which is the reaction between a substance and oxygen that um, it gives us heat and light, which is pretty much what you do, but more specifically, that produces carbon dioxide and water. So it's some substance, C3H8 in this case, reacting with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water as my products. So let's look at a, an example. C5H10 undergoes combustion. So what does that tell me? Well, if we think about it, combustion reactions are something, in this case, C5H10, reacting with oxygen, so my other reactant is oxygen, O2, because remember it's diatomic, to produce carbon dioxide and water. So my products must be carbon dioxide and water. And now I need to balance. So we've actually done some balancing of combustion reactions prior to this, but if um, you didn't pick up on it before, it's a good time to review. Um, a balancing sort of technique here, which is to leave the element that's by itself to the last for balancing. So I see the oxygen here on the reactant side is alone, so I'm gonna leave that to the end for balancing, and I'm gonna balance my carbons and my hydrogens first. I see that on the reactant side, I have five carbons and 10 hydrogens, so I'm gonna go ahead and put a five in front of the carbon dioxide and a 10 in front of the um, hydrogen. Now, whoops, not a 10, sorry about that. What I meant was a five. That gives me 10 H's on both sides, which is good, and five carbons on both sides, which is good. Um, and I have some oxygens over here, which I don't really care about yet. Over here though, I have five times two oxygens is 10, plus five times one oxygen, which is 15. Now the issue here is that 15 is an odd number, but when you look at my reactants, all my oxygens come in pairs, which means that I need an even number of oxygens, but I don't have an even number of oxygens. I have an odd number of oxygens in the product. 
This is not an uncommon thing that you'll find going on in combustion reactions. And so the approach to this problem is um, to change that number of oxygens to an even number. And to do that, we'll just go back here and multiply our C5H10 by 2, which will change this to 20 hydrogens and 10 carbons. So then we'll multiply this by 2, which will change this to a 10 and this to a 10, which now means I have 20 hydrogens and 10 carbons, and now my number of oxygens is twice my odd number, which is always an even number of 30, which means now, over here on my reactant side, I need a coefficient of 15. And last step is to check and make sure that I have the lowest common whole and whole number ratios for my coefficients, and I do. So let's go ahead and look at these examples of problems and classify them as combination reactions, decomposition, single replacement, double replacement, or combustion. Take a moment, hit pause, think about those, and then come back. Okay, in A, I see that I have an element reacting with a compound and that my element is coming in and bumping out um, something in my compound. So this is a single replacement reaction. Whoops, my writing's not showing up. So A is single replacement. I've got element plus compound going to compound plus element. In B, I have two things, two compounds combining to make one compound. So this is a combination reaction. I've got two things, two simpler things coming together to make one more complicated thing. So this is combination or synthesis. In the last one, I've got something reacting with oxygen. Now this is a little bit broader in terms of the types of combustion reactions that we were specifically talking about. Remember I said they always produce carbon dioxide and water. Mr. Stoker, in his textbook, says pretty much it's anything that reacts with oxygen. So in this case, you see you have a compound reacting with oxygen, so we'd call this combustion. Now, I would not expect you to be able to tell me what ammonia does when it's combusted, because expecting you to come up with NO and water would be asking a lot. I do expect you to be able to tell me when things contain carbon and hydrogen, just like the example that we did with C5H10, when they re react with oxygen, they will always form carbon dioxide and water. So those are the type of combustion reactions we're going to focus on in terms of your assessment. Um, we also have another type of chemical reaction, and this one is probably the one that I will assess you on the least. but. I want to give you some brief awareness of um, because for a couple of reasons. One, it may show up on the standardized ACS exam for the final. And two, when you go on to cellular biology and some of your other classes for your pre-health um, prerequisites, uh, the um, redox processes that occur in, in human anatomy is um, pretty important. So having some awareness of what that means is, is good preparation for those other classes. So here we go. In a redox reaction, one reactant undergoes oxidation and another reactant undergoes reduction, hence redox, reduction, oxidation. Oxidation means your reactant is losing one or more electrons. That means it's also what's called the reducing agent. Reduction is the opposite. In this case, the reactant is gaining one or more electrons, and it's called the oxidizing agent. And a uh, handy mnemonic to remember is Leo goes Ger, where lose electrons is oxidize, and gain electrons is reduce. So if something is losing electrons, it's being oxidized. If something is gaining electrons, it's being reduced. So again, oxidation means loss of electrons. Reduction means gain of electrons. The oxidizing agent is the substance that is gaining the electrons, and the reducing agent is the substance that's losing the electrons. For example, we could look at calcium metal and chlorine glass. And what you see here is starting 
um, on the reactant side with two elements, and they're coming together to form an ionic compound. And we know that elements, when they're by themselves, have charges of zero. So calcium is a zero in the reactants, and chlorine is a zero in the reactants. But when we look at the products, we know that calcium chloride has calcium with a plus two charge and chlorine with a negative one charge. So oxygen's charge went from zero to plus two. So if you think about that, that means that oxygen started with equal numbers of protons and electrons. But now it has two more protons than electrons. We remember from chapter three that elements don't lose protons, they lose electrons. So that means that calcium lost two electrons. And we actually know this from our conversation too of calcium making a charge, making an ion. We know that calcium um, wants to be like the nearest noble gas, which is argon, and to do that, it will lose two electrons and become calcium plus two. So in this case, calcium loses the electrons. Therefore, calcium loses electrons. It is oxidized. It is also the oxidized. <coughs> Excuse me. It is also the reducing agent. And I'll write that here in just a sec. Let's grab a drink of water. Chlorine, on the other hand, goes from zero to negative one. So it's gaining an electron, which means that chlorine is reduced. It gains, the it gains electrons. That also means that chlorine is the oxidizing agent. This is what it looks like. It's very fantastic. Okay, so that um, covers our first section of um, Chapter 9. The second part of Chapter 9 focuses on chemical reactions and why they occur. So what has to be necessary for a reaction to actually occur? And the theory that we have about this is that, re that reactants have to actually collide, which makes sense. If you are breaking and making new bonds between things, they've got to be in close proximity. Because if, if you're sitting, let's say, at home or maybe in the computer lab, if you've got an element at one end of the room and another element at the other end of the room, it's not like they're going to form a bond all the way across that distance. So they have to be in close proximity. And our theory says they actually have to smack into each other with quite a bit of energy. Um, that amount of energy that they collide with that's necessary for them to actually react is called the activation energy. Their orientation is important and uh, a couple of other things. So let's talk more about that collisions. They've got to collide, like I said, for any chemical change to occur. The activation energy um, is the minimum amount of energy that your reactants have to um, have in order for their collision to result in a chemical reaction. So that sounds like a lot of fancy language. Think about it in, in this sense. Think about how much money you have in your wallet right now. Um, I'm betting that most of you have a penny in your wallet. So if, if I said that the cost of, let's see, getting a haircut. Say you need a haircut. Let's say that the cost of getting a haircut was a penny. Most of you, if not all of you, could pay that cost. So in that case, your activation energy or your cost of doing the reaction is very low. On the other hand, if I said that the cost of getting the haircut was $200, how many of you actually have $200 in cash in your wallet right now? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't. So that would mean then that some of you do have that amount of money and are willing to pay for a haircut <laughs> of that expense, and some of you don't. So in that case, this illustrates the fact that some collisions will have enough energy or enough money in our metaphor to undergo the chemical change or the process, and some won't. So there's a, activation is energy is essentially the cost associated with doing the reaction. So think about this in terms of money, cost of the reaction. And not all of the reactants are carrying enough money in their wallet all the time to pay that cost. The orientation also matters. Um, sometimes you have very complicated reactant molecules that have to be oriented in a particular way in order for your collisions to lead to products. And if they're not, then you don't get products. I think we have a picture of this. So for instance, um, these little NO2 
two molecules and these CO molecules have to collide where the C runs into the O right there. But if instead the O on the C collides with the O, you get no reaction because that was not the right um, orientation. Or if either of them collides with the N, you get no reaction. So out of four possible ways to collide, only one of them, the top one, actually produces products. In chemical reactions, we can also talk about that, the total amount of energy that's either released or gained in the reaction. And for that, we use terms like exothermic and endothermic. And you'll recall, this is not the first time we've used exothermic and endothermic. When we talked about um, uh, physical state changes, melting, boiling, freezing, in Chapter 7, we talked about whether heat was going into the system, in which case the process was endothermic or whether heat was exiting the system, in which case the process was exothermic. So now we're moving from those physical state conversations to an actual chemical reaction. Does the reaction take energy in overall to um, go, or does it release energy overall? If it releases energy, then it's considered exothermic. Um, energy then is considered to be a product of the chemical reaction. So when you burn something, you put a small amount of energy in, you get a huge amount of energy out. When we total all of our energies, our overall um, flow of energy is out of the system, so burning of a fuel. A picture of this is what's called an, um, a reaction diagram, or excuse me, a reaction energy diagram. And I tend to... Um, uh, Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. I tend to abbreviate reaction as RxN, so that's what those, that writing is up there. This is a reaction energy diagram, and it's just showing that I can start with a certain amount of energy for my reactants, and I can end up with a certain amount of energy for my products. And along the way, we see, aha, here's that activation energy between here and here. That's that cost that the reactants have to pay in order to do the reaction. So here's my little reactant. He goes up here, pays the cost of the reaction, and then slides all the way down to products. Now notice when the reaction is done, I can look at the difference between the reactant's energy and the product's energy, and that is the amount of energy that in this case is lost, because I started high up here and I ended low, which means essentially I dropped in energy, so energy left the system. Energy exits. It's like saying I started with $50 and I ended with five. So clearly, $45 had to go somewhere. It left. Kind of makes you wonder where it went. Endothermic, on the other hand, um, is going to require energy to come into the system. Energy in this case is a reactant of the chemical reaction. Photosynthesis in plants is an example of this. You're constantly having input of energy from the sun to drive the process. And actually, it's pretty amazing. I mean, that's the reason photosynthesis is so fantastic, is you're turning solar energy into chemical energy that then can be more easily accessed by a variety of, of um, animals, us included. In this case, your average energy of reactants is going to be lower to begin with than your products. So I might start here with $5, but by the end, I end up with $50. Again, that difference between where the reactants start and the top of the hill is going to be the overall cost of doing the reaction. And the difference between my reactants energy and my products reaction, excuse me, my products energy is going to be the energy of the reaction. And in this case, energy is going into the system. So energy is coming in, energy flows in, and so therefore this is endothermic. So we also want to talk here about how fast reactions go. And that's looking at something called chemical reaction rate. What's the rate of a reaction? Is it a fast rate? Is it a slow rate? And what can we do to speed things up? And what can we do to cause things to slow down? Because sometimes we want to do that. Um, 
this generally is just talking about how fast are you consuming reactants or how fast are you producing products. There are four things that are going to affect reaction rate. Um, if you think about it, we've been talking about the fact that reactants have to collide, they have to have enough energy to pay the um, cost of doing the reaction, and so those are, and they have to have the correct orientation. So if you think about it, if you want a reaction to go faster, there's a couple different things you can do. You can change the physical nature of your reactants. So if you have two solids and you try and react them, it doesn't work very well. But if you have two liquids, you have good surface area contact between your reactants, in which case, what of those characteristics are you changing? Well, you're changing the contact between your reactants. So you're um, making those collisions easier to occur versus if I have two lumps of solids, uh, not much is going to happen. I can change the reactant concentrations. If I raise the concentration, then I have more stuff running around. And if I have more stuff running around, then I have more collisions that can occur. So imagine, if you will, a room full of people filled with, uh, and they're all blindfolded, and they're running around and occasionally they bump into each other, which we'll call a reaction. Now, if I open the door and put 50 more people in the room, how many more collisions do I have? A whole bunch more. I can raise the reaction temperature. Imagine those people again. At one temperature, they're moving kind of slowly, so not many collisions. But if I raise the temperature up now, they're jiggling around really fast, running really fast. How many more collisions occur? Quite a few. And then last, I can um, use a catalyst. And what a catalyst does, whoops, uh, it looks like we're going to talk more about these, sorry. Physical nature of the reactants, um, we already discussed this, the solid, liquid, or gas, or the particle size, right? If I subdivide things really, really small, the reaction goes a lot faster as well. Um, and we just talked about this, so we don't need to say that again. Solid state, yes, gets faster if you make your solids, your particle size smaller. Concentration rates, increase the rate, excuse me, increases the concentration, increases the rate of the reaction, because you've got more stuff, which means you have more collisions. Temperature, um, rate is going to go up as the temperature of the reactions increases, because the more you raise the temperature, the faster things go. All right, catalysts. This is a substance that we're putting into the chemical reaction that is, that is participating in the reaction but not actually being consumed. It's going to increase the reaction rate by providing an alternate pathway um, with a lower activation energy. So metaphor about this, if you imagine our classroom, um, our chemistry classroom, it has two doors in it. I'm going to stand in front of one door and say that you can't leave class unless you pay me $100. Well, that's a bunch of baloney, right? You'd say, no way am I paying you $100. I'm going to go out the other door because that's an alternate pathway that has a lower cost to you. So that's what a catalyst does. It provides an alternate pathway with a lower activation energy. Enzymes are amazing catalysts in the human body that do tons of things for us the biochemists are still trying to figure out how they do. Lots of research there. In terms of that reaction energy diagram, we can draw a picture um, where we look at, here was the uncatalyzed reaction. And oh, look, if we have a catalyst, now our activation energy has shrunk down to this. Lower cost of the reaction means more likely that the collisions that I have will actually have enough energy to go. Which brings us to our final topic, and don't get too excited because this is actually a fairly big one. I shouldn't say get too excited. <laughs> like, well, never mind. Anyway, chemical equilibrium. So the definition of chemical equi equilibrium is a point in the reaction where the forward rate of the reaction equals the reverse rate of the reaction. So they're occurring simultaneously at the same time at the same rate. The concentration of your reactants and your products stay constant. So you've got all this reactivity going on, but the concentrations overall aren't changing. It does not mean that my concentrations of reactants and products have to be equal. It means that the rate of which I'm going from reactants to products and from products to reactants has to be equal. So consider a couple of different examples of things. Consider. Um, 
and tell me which one is equilibrium. In one case, you have cars going through a Starbucks drive through in the morning. Um, so that's example number one, cars going through a Starbucks. Example number two is two people playing catch. And example number three is students um, leaving the classroom after the class is over. So which one of those, people going through the drive through at Starbucks, people playing catch, or people leaving the class after classroom is over, which of those is an example of equilibrium? Take a moment and think about that. Maybe hit pause here if you want to think for a while. Okay, so cars going through the Starbucks line, drive through window, are all going one direction, which means that in that case, I don't have a reverse reaction. So it's not an example of equilibrium. People throwing a ball back and forth, on the other hand, the ball is going both directions and it's going at an equal rate. So that is an example of equilibrium. And then my last example of students leaving the room after class is over, um, same problem. All the students get up and leave the class. There aren't any new students coming in, and so therefore the reaction rate is only one direction. So not an example of equilibrium either. Whoops. So lots of things are going on, highly dynamic, um, but your concentration stay constant. And what we can see is in a reaction, um, this graph that we're looking at, we've got um, the rate of the forward reaction. So I start out with hydrogen and iodide, and I'm making hydroiodic acid, or HI. Initially, I have high concentrations of reactants and low concentrations of products. So the rate of my reverse reaction initially is really low. But over time, as my forward reaction goes, my, rate, my reverse reaction will pick up, and eventually, they'll meet and I will create a steady state. And at that point, I have equilibrium. The rate of my forward and my reverse reactions are equal. Um, and we can look at this in terms of concentration. My reactant concentration is initially high up here, but over time it's dropping because I'm turning reactants into products. And initially, my product concentration is low, but it will rise as I turn to reactants into products. And then eventually, because my forward rate equals my reverse rate, the concentrations of each will become constant. Now notice, they're not at the same values. And that's OK. What's important about equilibrium is that they are constant. So they're not changing. So the reversible reaction, let's talk a little bit more about that, is this idea that my, my reactants can go to products, that's the forward reaction, and my products can go to reactants, that's the reverse reaction. It'll happen at the same time. Whoops, I'm going backwards. Probably already said that. Okay, out of this, we want to be able to know where equilibrium is in a chemical reaction. And because those concentrations stay constant once we get to equilibrium, we're going to use those concentrations as the place that defines equilibrium. So we're going to create this thing called an equilibrium constant, which is basically a number that tells us this relationship between reactants and products at equilibrium. So if I had this generic reaction where I had um, a plus B going to C plus D, and I had J, K, L, and M as my coefficients in my balanced chemical reaction, my equilibrium constant, um, the equilibrium constant is always going to be written as K, E, Q, is going to be the concentrations of my products raised to their coefficients as powers divided by the concentrations of my reactants raised to their coefficients of, as powers. And what's important to remember here is that um, what the terms that get included in the equilibrium constant expression are only for substances that are gases or aqueous, meaning a solution. Solids and liquids don't go in the equilibrium constant expression. So if A, let's say, was a solid, then A would not appear in this expression. Everybody else would, but because A is a solid, it's not in there. 
And that has to do with the fact that pure solids and liquids at equilibrium, their concentrations um, or their reacting concentrations, it's something to do with their reacting concentrations. So just remember, no solids, no pure liquids in equilibrium constant expressions. Okay, those square brackets, whoops, I should have mentioned that earlier. Let's go back to that slide. These square brackets that we're looking at here around each of these tell me molarity. So this is the molarity of C and the molarity of D divided by the molarity of A and B. That's what that first one is. Product concentrations are always placed in the numerator, so it's always products over reactants and the coefficients are the powers to which your concentrations are raised. So that's what we just talked about, but quick little review again to make sure it's cemented into your brain. Um, and then KEQ is the way that we denote an equilibrium constant. Only concentrations of gases and substances in solution are written. Pure liquids and solids are never included. And let's look at an example, number 52 in your textbook. So haul out your textbook, and let's look at 52 in chapter 9. Okay, so 52A says write equilibrium constant expressions for the following reactions. And in A, we have... 2 KClO3 solid goes to 2 KCl solid plus 3O2 gas. So take a moment and write what you think the equilibrium constant expression for that would be. Hit pause. Okay, so we're back. In A, I'm going to write the concentration of my substances in the products divided by the concentration of my substances in the reactants, omitting any pure solids or liquids. So in A, I've got a couple solids in there, so they're not going to show up in my equilibrium constant expression. So KEQ will equal just my gases or aqueous solutions, which in this case is just oxygen gas, and the coefficient of oxygen is 3, so this is raised to the third power. Let's do B. Hit pause while you do B. Okay. In B, I have PCl5 as a solid in equilibrium with PCl3 as a liquid plus Cl2 gas. Notice that double-headed arrow that you're seeing, that tells you you're at equilibrium. So an equilibrium constant expression for B, I want just my gases and aqueous solutions, so K equilibrium is only dependent on the chlorine. And it's raised to the first power because it has a coefficient of 1. Let's do C. Hit pause. Okay. For C, K equilibrium, I have a solid silver chloride in the product and an aqueous sodium nitrate. So I leave out the silver chloride because it's a solid. Put in that sodium nitrate. It has a coefficient of 1, so its power is 1. And then in the reactants, I have two aqueous solutions, so they show up in here as well. AgNO3 multiplied by the concentration of NaCl. Everybody has a coefficient of 1, so therefore everybody has a power of 1. Rea uh, equilibrium constants can tell us where the reaction is in terms of completeness. So if the equilibrium constant is really large, the equilibrium system contains more products than the reactants which if you think about it, um, makes sense because since K equilibrium equals the concentration of products divided by the concentration of reactants, oh, it's not going to show reactants there on the bottom, but you can imagine it. That means that if products are a big number, then reactants are a small number and K equilibrium should be a big number. On the other hand, if K equilibrium is small, that means I have lots of reactants, not very many products, which means the equilibrium system hasn't gone very far towards products, and I have more reactants. So this is a qualitative indication of the relative amounts of reactants and products, which is nice to know. Stoker has a table that sort of looks at some specific values 
you don't need to get the specific. You can just say very large numbers mean I'm favoring products and very small numbers mean I'm favoring reactants. So by very large, I mean more than one, uh, more than 10. And by small, we mean less than um, 0.1. So um, those, that's more of a general thing than they have here. Le Chatelier's principle is gonna tell us some things about what happens when we have a system in equilibrium and we go to, um, do something to it. So if you stress a system in equilibrium, the system will readjust so that it gets back to equilibrium. Um, if you have uh, more products that are being produced as a result, the equilibrium is said to have shifted to the right or towards the products. If you are causing more reactants to form, then the equilibrium is said to shift to the left or towards reactants. Let's look at some changes. If we change the concentration of something, so if I add something to the system, then I'm essentially raising the concentration of that side. So if I add reactants, if you think about it, I'm raising that concentration. To get back to equilibrium, the system will need to consume reactants by producing products. So it will shift to make products. So a general way of looking at this is where I've added stuff, the system is going to shift away from it in order to reestablish equilibrium. On the other hand, if I remove something, the opposite's going to occur. If I remove something, the system is going to shift towards the side that I've removed something in order to bring up that concentration. So here I have um, some nitrogen and some hydrogen, and they're at equilibrium with ammonia. So nitrogen, hydrogen, equilibrium with ammonia. I've got equilibrium. But if I increase H2, like here, then that means I've upset equilibrium. And so my reaction is going to shift away from the hydrogen towards the ammonia in order to raise up that concentration of ammonia and decrease the concentration of hydrogen. So compared in C, we see that compared to the original, Nitrogen has gone down, hydrogen has increased because of the addition, but it's decreased from what I started with in B, and my NH3 has increased. So overall, my reaction has shifted towards the products, towards producing products, away from my reactants. If I change temperature, that's going to have some effect on equilibrium as well, dependent on whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Because if you think about it, temperature is a way of adding heat or removing heat from a system. The equilibrium constant expression will always be constant um, at a given temperature, regardless of how many reactants or products we have. If the temperature changes, the equilibrium constant will change. So it's temperature dependent, essentially. If my temperature, if my forward reaction is exothermic, that means that heat is a product. And um, my equilibrium constant will decrease when I increase temperature. If the forward reaction is endothermic, then my equilibrium constant will increase with increasing temperature. So what happens to your equilibrium when the temperature is raised if I have an exothermic reaction? Well, you can see here that exothermic means, oh, it won't let me write means heat is a product over here. And if that's the case, if I'm raising the temperature, it's like I'm putting in heat. So if I'm putting in heat and heat is a product, then the reaction, the equilibrium will shift away from the heat. So raising the temperature on an exothermic reaction will shift towards the reactants. On the other hand, if I lower the heat, it's like I'm taking heat away. And so the reaction will shift towards the products, towards the heat. Um, we can also talk about pressure. If I decrease the volume of a system, that will shift the equilibrium toward the side with fewer moles of gas. So essentially squishing down makes the system go, oh, I'm taking, I've got a lot of, I've got less space to move around, so I'll, I'll um, adjust myself so that I have fewer moles of stuff running around. 
if I add a catalyst, it doesn't change the position of equilibrium, it just means things get there faster. So let's do some practice. Let's look at number 64 and apply all of this stuff that you've been talking about. So go ahead and look at 64 on your own first, A through D. Hit pause, and then we'll come back together and talk about it. Okay. Whoops. In 64A, we have this reaction, C6H6 as a gas, in equilibrium with, oops, excuse me, plus 3H2, also a gas, in equilibrium with C6H12 gas. And it tells you that heat is a product, which the other way that that could have been phrased is it could have said that the reaction is exothermic. And you would have had to recognize, oh yeah, that means heat's a product. So in A, we need to determine which direction the equilibrium will shift if we increase the concentration of C6H12. So in A, I'm adding reactants. We know from our discussion of Le Chatelier's principle that when I add stuff, equilibrium will shift away from where I've made that addition. So if I add reactants, the equilibrium will shift towards the products or towards the right. B says I'm going to decrease the concentration of C6H6. Remember, when we take something away, the reaction is going to reestablish equilibrium by moving towards where I've, where I've removed stuff. So if I decrease the concentration of C6H6, then the um, system will move to the left towards the reactants. So it will be said to shift left or shift towards the reactants. In C, decreasing the temperature means I'm removing heat, so the reaction will shift towards the heat side, so towards products. And in D, increasing the pressure by decreasing the volume of the container. Increasing the pressure means I'm going to want to go to the side which has fewer moles of gas. So on the reactant side in this problem, I have four moles of gas. On the product side, I only have one mole of gas. So that means the one mole of gas side will be favored when I increase the pressure. So this will actually shift towards products as well. OK. Did I just do 64 or 63? <laughs> I think I did a combination of 63 and 64. So let me erase all of what I did because that's going to be a little confusing for you. And make sure that I do 64 this time. I was partly looking at 63, the whole deal. Except now my eraser won't show up, of course. OK, so I'll just talk about it while my eraser comes in. So 64, I have C6H6, 3H2, C6H12 plus heat. So I have the right reaction written down. In A, I'm decreasing the concentration of H2. <laughs> yeah, I was doing 63 in A. So decreasing the concentration of H2 means I'm removing reactant, which means my equilibrium will shift towards the reactant side. B, increasing the concentration of C6H6. C6H6 is a reactant, so I will shift away from where I've increased the concentration, so that will shift towards products. Decreasing the temperature means I'm removing heat, which means I will shift towards the side with the heat, so I'll shift towards products. Looks like I got C right there. And then D, increasing the pressure by decreasing the volume of the container. Um, yes, I was looking at the right problem on that one. So my apologies on the confusion there. And that should be it for chapter 9. Except now my computer's frozen. Next. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Here we go with homework. So uh, 1 through 14, 19 through 44, 49 through 56, and 61 through 66. And it's a little broken up both because the oxidation reduction section um, goes into more detail on the practice problems that I'm really expecting you to know. And then um, the picture problems, students have a lot of difficulty with those for some reason, so you can pretty much skip those, and that's why those problems are left out. All right, I'll see you in class. Mm -hmm.